Introduction to fMRI and Connectivity. So I basically put together four uh, lectures in, in, uh, in, in the, the talk today. Um, where is the chat? Okay. Uh, Alexa, maybe interrupt me if there are questions because I, I can't seem to be finding the, the chat. Uh, I have too many uh, windows open and I don't want to freeze my computer again. Yeah, sure. I keep you posted if there's questions. Wonderful. So I'm, I'm really thinking I'm going to try to cover in the next like roughly hour uh, the first and third lectures. The first one is really on what is fMRI measuring. And the third one is uh, how do you compute connectivity measures, like the most basic, where they come from and you know, how you calculate it and how people kind of interpret them. And for the folks who are interested in learning more, I could do a little bit like what Karim did yesterday and double down and I've prepared two other lectures that are potentially of interest. One more on like what's preprocessing, what are the main step of preprocessing in fMRI analysis. And uh, lecture number four is uh, more like brain parcellation or how you define regions in the brain and that can be used then for like graph analysis or just data dimension reduction. This is something that's quite common and also plays a role in, in most papers that, that do connectivity. So uh, maybe we can do a little poll at the end to see if people want you know, to, to hear that at all or is it just fine with, with the slides and, and which one would they want to hear about. There, I can make them relatively fast, so I may actually be able to cover all that material in two hours. Your, your head may uh, spin a little at the end, but it, 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 it's possible. So I'm going to get started with uh, the first uh, topic, which is uh, the measure we have in fMRI, which is called the bolt signal. And that pretty much there's three, three things you need to understand here. First, what's the neurovascular coupling? Uh, it's really what we're measuring. Uh, then understand why we have signal at all, and that has to do with the magnetic properties of hemoglobin, uh, depending on its state, whether it's uh, oxygenated or not. And finally, understand what we talk about when we talk about the hemodynamic response function, which is tightly related to this idea of neovascular coupling, but which is more a model, uh, really, than, than a, a biophysical uh, process. So functional MRI, it's a 4D imaging modality. Um, here, what you have is actually a structural MRI, which is the most common type of MRIs people know about. Uh, a structural MRI typically is at one millimeter isotropic voxels, so one by one by one. Um, and uh, an fMRI voxel is typically more in the order of two to three millimeters isotropic, which means that an fMRI voxel is about 30 times bigger than a structural voxel, because you know, three by three is nine uh, by three, 27. So you have 27 uh, cubic millimeters in a, in a bold uh, voxel as opposed to a one uh, cubic millimeter in a structural one. For each one of these voxels though, we have access to time series. So really we're acquiring a full brain volume every two seconds. Uh, you can go down actually for full brain coverage, you can go down to about 700 milliseconds with like the most um, uh, novel uh, types of sequences. Uh, so you, you get those, those, for each point in your brain, you have really a time series. Uh, you can have hundreds of time points um, in, in a single sort of run, uh, which is the time between you switch the machine on and off. Uh, some people have scanned themselves extensively. Ross Poldrack in Stanford scanned themselves like every week for a year or something like that. So we, we have some data sets even at the individual level where we have tens of thousands of, of brain images. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in a project where uh, by the time we're going to complete it, I believe we're going to have about a million brain images per subject. <laughs> so you, you, you get basically a pretty detailed idea of, of what's uh, go, going on there. Uh, so that's why we have a fairly low spatial resolution. Uh, first to get a good SNR, but also because we, we want to be able to sample the brain uh, pretty fast. So as I said, the, the origin of the signal in fMRI is really the, the neovascular coupling. And it's a, if you're not familiar with it, it's actually pretty uh, uh, strange phenomenon. So it's been known since about you know, 130 years or so, uh, the, the, this idea of the coupling. And that is that when the, the, the blood oxygen reaches the neurons, it, it 
uh, very uh, precise spatially. So you get like big arteries that get to the brain, uh, the cycle of release, but those big arteries break down. Uh, imagine like huge highways into small highways, into little roads, into like a tiny road, into like a, a, a dirt road. Um, and at the end of the day, you, you, barely, you can barely see if there's a pass or not and you're in the forest. Well, those are the micro capillaries. Um, as their name implies, they are the, the, the microscopic scale and they bring the blood next to the neuron. Uh, immediate vicinity. So you, we can do fMRI actually with laminar um, resolution in the cortex. So it's uh, definitely some millimetric the type of, of uh, blood delivery, uh, oxygenation uh, delivery through the blood that we that we're capturing. And uh, I, I put this beautiful reference here of Roy and Cheriton from uh, 1890, where they inserted uh, probes in the brain uh, of animals and uh, did a number of experiments, uh, including nerve sleep stimulation, and already noticed that the change of neuronal activity would drive a change in blood oxygenation um, in, the, in the brain. And, um, and that change is extremely uh, specially uh, resolved, uh, which is something that's pretty mind-blowing, actually, the, the, the level of control. And I believe there's a good reason for that is because the brain con consumes a lot of oxygen. And you don't want to mess up with, with that because you know it's really the, the fuel that lets uh, the neuron work. So it has to be uh, uninterrupted at all time. So you, you need pretty much a lot of fuel uh, and, and you never want to be in short supply. So the, the brain has, has developed this amazing delivery system that can adapt the, 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 the amount of fuel that goes in an area very dynamically and very precisely um, in, in space. And that's really what we're capturing in fMRI. We don't see neuronal activity directly. We just look at the amount of oxygen in blood. So all that works in terms of, of metabolism is very complex. And I'm not going to touch upon that in, in any details today. Uh, you can check out this relatively old reference by uh, Higer and Reis, uh, which is still like very good. Uh, gives a, a nice little overview. I would say that you know, the, the core mechanisms have been elucidated in the 90s. And the basic idea is that when uh, neuron population are, are, are very active, they release a lot of neurotransmitters through synapses. And those neurotransmitters are, are constantly being released, uh, broken down, and reassembled. Um, so they, they go through the synaptic cleft, and they get attached to receptors, and then they, they get disassembled. Otherwise, they would be excitating the, the receptors permanently. That wouldn't be good. And uh, all that requires a lot of chemistry going on. And that chemistry happens in astrocytes that surround the neurons. And for that chemistry to work, it needs some energy. And basically, that energy takes two main forms, long term at least, and that's the glucose and the oxygen. So when you have an increase in, in synaptic activity, what you're going to see is a, a, an increase in oxygen extraction. And that triggers a very weird phenomenon. When you have a more demand in oxygen extraction, uh, the capillaries are going to respond and they're going to expand and the blood is going to start going faster. So essentially, uh, that's a little bell, gling, 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 I need food. And then the capillaries are, let's go, bring it on. And, and there's like a, a huge uh, uh, influx of fresh blood that's coming. The analogy that Buxton used, which is beautiful, is that you, you can imagine a field. In that field, you have a, a flower that is thirsty. And uh, then the brain responds to throw a swimming pool at it. So there won't be any trouble. The, the flower is going to be good, get enough, uh, enough water. And hopefully, obviously, the, the brain can afford to do that permanently. So that's why there's such a, a, a refined uh, control mechanism. So the, the fresh blood is only sent when uh, needed. I'm going to take a quick pause, unfortunately, to try to uh, remove the important background noise I have at the moment. Uh, my apologies for that. Uh, uh, Alexa, maybe that wasn't too long of an interruption. I am uh, sorry about that. So we just touched about the neurovascular coupling. Uh, so in practice, it looks like that. Uh, you've got a, a trigger, which is a sudden burst in neuronal activity here at time zero. And following that, you're going to have essentially two parallel phenomena. 
uh, you have a brief uh, increase in the relative concentration of deoxyhemoglobin, which is the hemoglobin bringing the, 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 in, in the blood that carries oxygen. Now it's losing its oxygen to go in the astrocytes. But very quickly, this, getting, uh, this gets overwhelmed by a huge increase in fresh blood. And so you have this massive increase in uh, local concentration of uh, oxygenated uh, hemoglobin. And that whole process is called the hemodynamic response. So, but I mean, the things like, how can we make images of that? Well, there's this really cool um, uh, characteristic that was described by uh, Pauli in 1936, uh, which is that uh, the hemoglobin molecule changes its conformation, whether it carries uh, oxygen or not. And because of that, this change of conformation, it completely changes its uh, magnetic properties. So oxyhemoglobin is diamagnetic, uh, which means that it sort of like resists man magnetic field, but very weakly. So it actually doesn't perturb uh, the magnetic field much. While the oxyhemoglobin is quite strongly paramagnetic. So it goes with the magnetic field, but sort of messes up with it. So uh, uh, with um, magnetic resonance uh, imaging, what we do is that we, we sort of manipulate the, the magnetic, the micro properties of, of atoms in terms of their magnetic field, their spins, and uh, adding a paramagnetic uh, substance is going to um, uh, accelerate the dephasing of those spins. And that means that the signal is actually going to be lower when there's a lot of uh, paramagnetic uh, substances. So in brief, uh, we, we can measure it through its magnetic field, es essentially. Uh, they, they're almost like two different products as far as magnetism is, is, is concerned. So we can uh, do a contrast on, on that. So essentially, you can, you can break down this like, whole process of measuring a, a hemodynamic uh, uh, response in fMRI with uh, many steps. Uh, it starts with uh, the synaptic activity that triggers this neurovascular coupling mechanism that changes the blood flow, that itself changes the blood oxygenation with a typo in oxygenation, sorry about that. And uh, finally, that creates this like magnetic signal that's called the BOLD signal. And BOLD stands for blood oxygenation level dependent, which means that you know, it just has to do something with blood oxygenation. Uh, in terms of, of temporal resolution, it takes roughly five seconds to, to, to come and peak, and then slowly it fades away and goes back to, to baseline, which can take like over 10 seconds. So no matter how fast we sample our data, the truth is that we're looking at a fairly slow uh, process with fMRI. Now, uh, there's been some hypotheses that have been done on, on how this uh, response behaves in order to be able to um, uh, do statistics and infer uh, things on the underlying neuronal activity from the sort of measures we are taking. And I would say that one of the, of the key um, uh, hypotheses that have be, been done is that the, the neurovascular coupling and the hemodynamic response behave more or less like a linear time invariant system, which means that um, well, I'm going to get uh, to Amina to, 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 to know what this means. But essentially, you, you think about the, the brain and, and the brain uh, oxygenation response as a kind of system where you, you would have an in input, which can be an impulse. So you, you flash uh, light in the eye of the subject, and you're going to observe a certain output, which is you know, what shape of uh, changes of oxygenation happen in, in a particular brain region. So the input would be here, this little Dirac, spike the, the blue the blue impulse on the left and and the hemodynamic response function would be this what you get as an output in red and so saying that it's a linear i mean one of the, the, the like more central sort of hypothesis is uh, that it's additive so if you think about a long stimulation right like now you're you're actually showing light in the eye of your subject for say 10 seconds well Showing light for 10 seconds is a little bit like showing light for one second 10 times in a row. So in my, in my graphic here, I just have like three repetitions. But the idea is that you, you can do those type of stimuli separately, right? Like you can actually show light for 
in my graphic here three seconds and see what is the response you get. And separately, you can actually show for just one second, you're going to get a smaller response. And then what you do is that you uh, just shift that response in time and add them. And if everything goes well and the system is additive, uh, the long response is actually just a sum of the, of the short responses. All right, so uh, that, that the, 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 the additive property and uh, actually in there, there's also a time invariant property, which is like the, the response to small stimuli doesn't change over time. Uh, you can very easily actually imagine systems which are not time invariant, say um, pain. If you, if you shock people after a while, they kind of become numb. So you, you don't have as much a strong response over time when you repeatedly uh, um, shock people, I, I think. I've never done it myself, but that's beside the point. I'm getting a little bit like last year. You, you, you get this idea, long response, a response to a long stimulus equals the sum of the response to sh short stimulus. Uh, and uh, I, a lot of the, of the software that I use task-based fMRI sort of has that hypothesis strongly built in inside of it. And uh, interestingly, it was formulated in the early 90s, people started doing that, but it's not before the early 2000 uh, that we, we actually got good experimental evidence that this assumption is actually reasonable. Uh, so that was achieved by a landmark paper by Logotetis and colleague in uh, published in Nature Neuroscience 2001. And what they did was actually totally crazy that they were able to build a system uh, to do intracortical electrophysiological measures at the same time as they were doing uh, MRI measures. And I'm saying it's crazy because it is crazy. Um, when you know like basic physics of our electric fields work. Like if you mess up with magnetic fields, you cannot really get a good measure of electric fields. It's just like because you know messing up with magnetic field creates huge change in, in electric potentials. So it creates like an insane amount of noise in your in your electrical uh, measures. But it's through they found a number of, of ways to either uh, avoid this interaction by interrupting uh, some of the magnetic uh, manipulation and also denoising their, their signal because even though the noise is very large, it's also uh, very uh, prototypical and well characterized. So they managed to actually record the activity of neurons in the visual cortex of monkeys at the same time they were doing bold imaging on, on them. And what they did is an experiment where they directly tested the additivity of the system. So my little schematic I was, I was showing and that looked a little bit childish because I, I drew it myself. Uh, uh, it, it's actually what they did. So it, uh, it, it, it was a, a, a childish description of a, a really interesting uh, scientific experiment. So here, what you have on the left is basically um, here you have a visual stimulus of about uh, three seconds, then uh, six seconds and 12 seconds and 24 seconds. And um, the blue curve shows you what's called the local field potential activity, which is one of the way you can um, summarize the, the activity of, uh, of your uh, uh, neuronal population based on intracortical measures. And then in, uh, in um, in um, red, you have the bold activity in that same region. And what you can see is that the longer the stimulus is, the longer the underlying local field potential activity is, it follows a, a block pretty tightly connected to the length of the stimulus. And then uh, you've got a response that's gonna become gradually, gradually more important in the, in the bold signal. Now, does it precisely fit a linear in invariant um, uh, uh, model assumption? They directly tested that. So what you have in the gray is uh, actually a prediction of what the bold signal would be if its input were the LFP and uh, the system was uh, linear and time invariant. And as you can see, for shorter stimuli, it, it's, uh, tightly, uh, it tightly fits. So uh, the linear time invariant hypothesis is, is pretty spot on. There, there's some discrepancies that start emerging for longer stimulus, like uh, over 20 seconds. 
but for short time scales, it looks to, to work pretty neatly. Now, bear in mind that here our input is uh, the LFP activity. Now, this LFP activity could have been uh, almost approximated as what's called a boxcar function, where you just like turn it on and off based on whether you're stimulating or not. You've got the, the lines here indicate the, the, the start and stop of the stimulus. So, you know, even if we didn't have the LFP uh, measures, just by knowing what kind of task we, we did and when we did them, we could have predicted those responses pretty uh, accurately. And that was exactly what the popular software called SPM for statistical parametric maps does. It, it does this kind of assumption and predicts uh, bold activity based on experimental design. So here you go. Uh, I think I took uh, 25 minutes to give you a tour of the history of bold signal. Um, I, I did this little schematic here to sort of recap how, how things evolved. It all started with uh, the 19th century and basic discoveries that uh, blood oxygenation in the brain couples with neuronal activity. Then in the early 20th century, they figured out actually uh, hemoglobin had different magnetic properties, whether it was uh, oxygenated or not. And the, in the early 90s, some, a group of people figured out, you know, we've, we've got those MRI machines, uh, we know that hemoglobin uh, changes its status based on neuronal activity and also changes magnetic property. Why could we do an image of brain activity? And they started with things that was really basic, like um, sort of uh, um, uh, uh, visual stimuli versus non-visual uh, stimuli. And they found a map of the visual cortex and they were, oh my God, this looks like it's working. And initially there was a lot of skepticism because you know, how could you possibly map neural activity with, with vasculature, that's ridiculous. Well, it created an entire field. So it, it actually works remarkably well. Uh, there's lots of caveats, obviously, but um, the, the basic principle is very robust. Uh, in the 98, uh, uh, Richard Buxton proposed uh, the first uh, sort of biophysical, biophysiological model of the neurovascular coupling from neurotransmitters to, 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 to blood oxygenation, volume, and, and flow. And finally, in 2001, Nikos Lokotetis um, uh, had this landmark paper showing that indeed in animal models, uh, uh, local feed potential, and actually also multi-unit activity, uh, correlate uh, really well in the visual cortex with uh, with bold signal. So that's, that's all I got actually on the bold signal, and I, I mean, I'm. Maybe I'm going to take a little break. Whether there, there are questions. Also, let me know if you if you want uh, me to slow down the pace a little bit. Like I'm assuming a lot of you have, have got some training on this, and I, I I don't need to necessarily explain in in great details. But um, Pierre, there was a question earlier about the resolution. Yeah. Um, if one voxel is 30 times bigger than the real structure, then is it the same for a 7T scanner? So, uh, it's sometimes, so at, at typical resolution, and I use three millimeter, uh, because you can, that's a parameter you can, you can change, right? Um, uh, you're about 30 times bigger than a typical structural scan. Now, I, I you know, the, ultimate uh, spatial resolution of, of the brain is more like the micron. So, you, you know, you <laughs> several, several, uh, many order of magnitudes away from the true structural resolution. Uh, but that's true when you do brain studies in general, like you, you always have to navigate through scales. Um, uh, even if we had data at the uh, most uh, minute scales there is, I don't think we, we would know what to do with it or even actually be able to store it. Uh, so that was for the first part of the question. The second part was a 70 imaging. Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah obviously. So the, the, the stronger your, your magnet, so the, the T stands for Tesla. It's the strength of uh, the, the main field of the MRI. And uh, the stronger your field, uh, the, the more you can mess with magnetism and the faster you can mess with magnetism. So you, you can do your images uh, faster, or you can do your images with better resolution, or, or do a little bit of both. It's really like a, a designing sequences in MRI is all a matter of trade-off. You can go for crazy uh, resolution, but then you lose in temporal resolution, and also you lose a lot in SNR. 
uh, but um, uh, at 70, you unlock uh, laminar imaging. Like you can start making uh, brain images that are so uh, fine in resolution that you can distinguish the, the main layers of the, of the cortex inside the gray matter, which is about three millimeters thick, actually often less than that. So it's definitely possible at 70 to, to break the resolution uh, pretty dramatically compared to what I was describing. Uh, it comes with uh, lots of problems too. There's crazy artifacts with, uh, with eye fields. So it's, it's really all a matter of trade-off. I would say that actually for most applications, 3T remains the state of the art. But if your goal is to go to crazy spatial resolution, 70 or 90 or 11T may be the way to go. Uh, uh, are there other questions on that? Yeah, there were no other questions so far. It's a really bad sign. It means I'm going too fast. No, oh. some people said the pace is good. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do now is actually, because I have about like 20 minutes, half an hour max, what I'm going to do is that I'm, I'm going to switch to the third uh, part of my talk which I think is a, of, of broader interest for, for people. And as I said, I can go to, to that part uh, later if, uh, if that's of interest. So the second part of my talk is to talk about functional connectivity, which is one of the main ways to analyze fMRI data. Um, I, I wouldn't, it's not necessarily yet the main way. The main way would still be statistical parametric mapping in task-based fMRI, but, um, that's not what I do, so that's not what I'm going to present. Um, so the, the, this is sort of like very short uh, lecture I've put together. The, the main thing I, I wanted to achieve were uh, for you to understand what is functional connectivity, when we use that word, what we mean, and um, also understand this concept of in extrinsic versus intrinsic activity. Because I find even actually people who, who, who do this type of analysis and have, have, have had training on this type of analysis, they're often confused about resting state versus task versus a default mode. And, and I think, I mean, most of those things that are, those confusion stems actually from the, the terms that are being used, that are being poorly chosen. I think that the, the, the main distinction that's important to have in mind is uh, intrinsic versus extrinsic. So I'm going to try to explain a little bit to you what that means and uh, how that relates to experimental data. And finally, I'm going to present you a basic regression analysis in fMRI connectivity. So we're not going to touch to any fancy analytical techniques here, just like what kind of measure we're extracting. So in a way, we're still in the pre-processing <laughs> pipeline. Um, and then, you know, that type of analysis, all the caveats we talked about during week one apply. You know, we're going to have p-values, we don't want p-value. It's mostly univariate. You want to do multivariate. You can do machine learning and so on and so forth. But the vast majority of papers that do those type of multivariate analysis and you see in the literature, they're all based on the metrics I'm going to present to you. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's you know, in that sense, uh, going uh, more complex and more advanced uh, doesn't have much idiosyncrasy. Like, uh, you know, whether you would do more complex with structural MRI or PET or whatever would work the same way uh, to a large degree. All right, so uh, why uh, functional connectivity? Well, the, the sort of, uh, the, the, I, I'd say it's uh, in the early 2000s, there was this big push to try to conceptualize our brain imaging measure as uh, network measures. Um, I think, I mean, the, the person who really formalized that was Olaf Spons, who coined the term uh, connectomics. But uh, actually, uh, in, in, at least in my, in my personal history, um, the, the person who really uh, nailed that point down for me was Francisco Varela, who was a, um, a huge figure in the field in the early 2000s before his uh, untimely death, actually applied to his lab as a master student, but he was he had already passed away. Um, that's an image from one of his uh, uh, re review in 2001. Uh, which I would encourage you to read if you haven't. It's a, it's a beautiful piece of work. And uh, the idea is that, you know, uh, cognition emerges through uh, neuronal assembly, which are dynamic, and organize themselves at two basic scales, one which is local, with a 
small region of the cortex highly specializing for special, certain tasks and being highly interconnected through what's called the cytoarchitecture. That is, that in the gray matter, that small layer of, of, um, of matter at the surface of, of the brain, uh, you have lots of connections, lots of axons that just stays in the gray matter. So neurons that are next to one another, locally, they're highly interconnected. But you also have connections between brain um, uh, regions, almost regardless of their physical distance. Despite the fact that neurons are very costly from a metabolic perspective, the brain is really highly interconnected. So you're going to have connections that go from the occipital cortex all the way at the back to the frontal cortex all the way at the front. And bear in mind that all of that eventually is you know, connected to the spinal cord that connects to the rest of your, of your body. So we're just like a big interconnected web as a, as a, as a, a unit, I, I would say. Um, uh, but uh, the, the, the brain is uh, strikingly uh, packed with highway of, of neuronal uh, connections. And what those highway allow is uh, synchronization of large-scale assemblies, uh, what's also called networks. Uh, and it's believed that you know, key cognitive abilities such as working memory in humans actually rely on those type of distributed assemblies. So you don't really have a, a working memory region. You have a, a working memory network. And that is very uh, un uncontroversial at, at this stage. Um, and so in the early 2000s, people have used tools that were mainly dedicated to sort of map out how a particular experiment changes activity in the brain. But they, they started saying, can we have tools to really capture connectivity directly? Because we, we know that's a kind of like main guiding principle of brain organization. And uh, what they came up with is um, uh, actually driven by a, a landmark experiment by Bart Bisval in 95, we, which went mostly ignored uh, in the late 90s and I raised lots of uh, skepticism. I started my, my research career uh, in 2002. I attended HBM in 2003 in New York and uh, I presented already on sort of like connectivity approaches. And a lot of the people that stopped by my poster were like, oh, so you're working on cardiac noise, right? Uh, whatever, man. <laughs> Thank you for the, for the feedback. Um, but it turned out it, it, it actually uh, is not noise. Um, so what, what uh, Bart Bisval did, he was actually more, more interested in, uh, in physical properties of uh, the MR noise. And so he, he did uh, uh, an experiment to identify a little region of the brain that is uh, strongly modulated by motor activity and hand motor activity. So he got this little region that's on the left in orange and he, he tried to say to people to do nothing. So obviously, you know, their brain activity would be noise because they weren't doing a task. And then he looked what that noise looks like. And that little, you know, plot is what the noise looks like. And uh, for a noise, it's uh, very structured. Instead of having, you know, very fast oscillation, you have those very slow oscillations that last about 20, 30 seconds actually uh, they, they can even last up to a minute. Um, we got an example around here. Um, I think yeah, it's in seconds. So yeah, yeah, you have roughly you know, 40, 50 seconds here. So that right there was really intriguing. Like, what are those slow waves? It's weird. And so uh, to try to understand more the, 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 the spatial uh, correlation structure of this noise, what he did was simply use that as a regressor and uh, correlate the activity of that particular region that he called the seed with the, the activity of every single voxel in the brain, which at this resolution of three meters of tropic, you have roughly 50,000 in it. And when you push it to high resolution, you get closer to a million. So you can get really a, a map and that's what's shown at the, at the bottom. Like for each point in the brain, what you have is a Z-score on the significance of the correlation between the activity of that particular point in the brain and the activity of that seed region. And what he observed was really striking, although not as striking as this map, because in 95, he had only a few slices in the brain and the images were extremely noisy and ugly. But that's kind of like a modern replication. Um, you get this like real distributed network. 
And if you know anything about uh, system neuroscience, uh, the distributed networks is a motor network. Those are all regions that directly, well, the primary ones have direct connection to spinal cord. And then you have a, 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 an extended network of regions which are well known for coordinating motor activities, such as the supplementary motor area. And uh, what's beautiful is that you also have subcortical mapping. So for example, here you, you've got a, a cerebellum uh, point and it's super interesting because you, you start it from the left uh, hand motor area and uh, you find the right cerebellum, uh, which it's something that's really well documented, like the, the tracks coming from the body. Uh, they actually, the left is on the left and the right is on the right when you reach the cerebellum and then they cross. And when you get to cortex, they, they, go, they go the other way. So I may have mixed up my left and my uh, right here. It's a, it's a motion of the right hand. So you get the left motor cortex and the right cerebellar cortex. So it's, it's a, a beautiful sensory motor map, except there was no sensory motor experiment here. Uh, all the subject was doing was to lie in a scanner and do nothing. Uh, so what you're looking at is spontaneous activity. And I think, I mean, it blows my mind that uh, actually people were surprised in retrospect, it's always easy. But already uh, 2000 years ago, uh, a famous Latin philosopher said, uh, rest is far from restful. And that's something we know about neurons. Even if you, if you cut a neuron and you put it outside on a, on a, on a counter, the thing is gonna keep like creating action potentials. And that's what neurons do there, they are active. And there are absolutely no way that the brain does nothing when you're at rest. And actually for anybody who's been in an MRI scanner, it's very tempting to scratch their nose, very tempting. And when you do that, uh, you pretty much elicit the same kind of uh, neuronal pattern as if you were actually scratching your nose. And actually some people do scratch their nose. So it's absolutely unsurprising that you would have spikes of activity when people are engaged in, in, in some kind of like mental motor imagery. And, and these processes may be um, uh, unconscious to some degree as well. But uh, I think there is no mystery here. You have a spontaneous thoughts that are driving different cognitive components, including a motor component. So you're going to have a structured activity in the sensory motor cortex. And uh, so you, you, when you regress out uh, that through the sensory motor network, you get a, a map. I'm going to have to, to make a quick pause again to try to get silence in my house. Sorry about that. So that one was short, um, but you get the idea. Now, we get the sensory motor network here because we looked at a motor seed. But if you change the seed region, you're going to get maps of other systems. So, and that was performed with only five minutes of data. So slowly in the early 2000s, people started to realize that with five minutes of data, you could get maps of the ma major uh, functional systems in the brain uh, without the subject doing anything. So with the high compliance as well. So that created a, a huge uh, spike of interest. And I told you my, my little anecdote from 2003, but by 2010, uh, fMRI connectivity at rest had become you know, uh, almost the majority of posters at HBM. So it really uh, took the field by storm. Now, uh, something that people typically associate with uh, resting state connectivity is the default mode network. And the default mode network has some connection with resting state connectivity, but it's really its own thing. And it can be studied without fMRI and actually has been discovered without fMRI. So I, I wanted to clarify what the default mode network is, even though it's actually not even fMRI, to sort of try to dispel this confusion between resting state and default mode. So in the 90s, uh, people were doing a lot of task-based analysis. And they had this very weird finding that when they were doing a task, uh, some uh, brain region became more active and that was easy to interpret. And you could get, say, an auditory network or a visual network that way. But there were also some regions that would become less active when people were doing a task and people were curious about that. And in 97, Schulman and colleagues actually released a meta-analysis using PET imaging where they showed that glucose metabolism, which is tightly coupled with oxygen metabolism, 
would go down in a consistent set of region, pretty much over a wide range of tasks in different uh, uh, domains. And those regions included the posterior cingulate cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, and bilateral um, um, so the, the parietal uh, temporal juncture. Um, uh, so, and, and some temporal cortices as well. So that's what's shown on the left. You had this like kind of distributed uh, set of areas. And um, that led uh, Mark Reichel in 2001, if I remember correctly, the paper came out where he suggested, well, um, you know what, when we're at rest, we're thinking about a lot of things. And those things are not exactly random. You know, you're going to be thinking about um, uh, what you're going to have to do tonight, maybe what you need to, to buy for the dinner. And uh, you, so you do a lot of sort of mental projection of yourself. You're going to be like maybe simulating a bit some conversation. I, you know, met Bob in the stairs. He said this very mean thing to me. I didn't know what to respond. But if I had said that, he would not have been able to respond. It would have been fantastic. And I could have said that too. So, you know, you've got those kind of like simulated uh, activity. Um, uh, and um, he, he, he felt like, uh, we're actually spending a substantial amount of our time every day doing that. So the same way we have a visual system and a motor system and an auditory system, maybe we have this system for, you know, uh, mind wandering. <laughs> but instead of calling it the, the mind wandering system, he called it the default mode. Because for him, it's kind of like when you don't have anything to do, you're not engaged around you, you go back to your default. And we would have a brain system to implement a default activity. Actually, interestingly, those regions overlap like memory and, uh, and language as well. Uh, so, yeah, um, that's it. That was his hypothesis, the default mode network hypothesis of the brain. And it had nothing to do with the fermi. Um, now, in, uh, in 2003, um, uh, Mike Gracious published a landmark paper in PNAS where he said, you know what, Bisval in 95, he found this like sensory motor network with a sensory motor seed. Uh, like a few years back, Raikol said, oh, there's a default mode network in the brain and the posterior cingular cortex is an important part of it. So if his hypothesis is right, if I put my seed in the PCC, I should get the default mode network. And it worked. <laughs> and interestingly, it works every time and at the individual level. So if you stick somebody five minutes in the scanner and you put your seat in the PCC, you're going to get a default mode network map. And that's wonderful. And it actually fits beautifully with, uh, with the PET, PET uh, imaging results. And if you look at the time course, you, you've got those slow time waves. Here you have a, 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 a time frequency analysis uh, that shows the dominance of, of frequency below 0 0.1 hertz that uh, Bisval had already noted. And so that confirmed the default mode network hypothesis and recent fMRI became the tool of choice to map the default mode network. Uh, but that's just one of many networks you can, you can map and uh, definitely not the only resting state network. And uh, default mode and resting state, I mean, yeah, the default mode network is this like mind wandering network. So in, the, in this sense, it is the resting state network, except you can map uh, all the other ones as well. So. Uh, it, it's uh, really confusing uh, if you equate resting state with default mode. Like the default mode network is a particular network that just happen to be more engaged when you don't do anything in particular. So here you have this nice timeline made by uh, courtesy of Dan Margulies showing uh, the history, the early history of uh, fMRI connectivity. It all starts with the landmark uh, Bisval et al. 95 paper published in an obscure uh, specialized uh, uh, magnetic resonance journal, uh, which goes to show that uh, most important literature does not come out in nature, at least not every time. Then you've got the Schulman meta-analysis, the 2001 Reichel paper, which was really like more of a, a, a theory. There was the, the experimental data for a theory came from the Schulman paper. And then in 2003, you have the Gracious paper which is really belongs to both literatures. It is a landmark paper to study the default mode network. It's also a landmark paper to study resting state connectivity. 
in fMRI. But eventually, there's a whole literature on the default mode network that has nothing to do with fMRI, or at least resting state fMRI. So they're using task, they also just use behavior, try to understand actually what people think about when they don't think about anything in particular. Uh, Jonathan Smallwood, for example, is a, a, a scientist who does mostly study this type of man laundering processes. And uh, resting state connectivity is just one of the tools he used in his, in his toolbox. Uh, and, but as I said, you can also study many other networks and do many other things and default mode network activity in, in resting state fMRI. And there's a, a, a host of paper doing resting state connectivity that don't look at the default mode. So another key sort of result there is out there is this idea of negative correlation at rest. It's a little bit um, uh, controversial because it's gonna depend highly how you preprocess your data, whether you observe this or not. But Mike Fox and, and colleagues in 2005 reported that the uh, default mode uh, network activity actually correlated negatively with what they call the task positive network and which is like more like attentional network really which is something that's uh, positively activated in uh, many tasks you, you may do as soon as you request subject to basically pay attention to the outside world, that network tend to actively, uh, positively activate. And, uh, and so that comforted them in that idea that at rest, you would spontaneously navigate um, windows where you're more uh, driven through your internal thinking which would be a default mode thing. And uh, Windows where we do pay attention more to what's going on around you. Uh, and that would create those negative correlation between the spontaneous activity of those two networks. On paper, it's very attractive. In practice, those correlations are, are weak at best and depend a lot on preprocessing. But it's still like a, a, a central notion, something that you know, any researcher working in the field kind of like have in mind. So I wanted to have it in, uh, in there. Um, I'm almost done actually. So we started at, at 10 past nine, um, but I, I think we're just gonna probably be in the five minutes. Uh, I, I think like, you know, how the same way we had Logothetis uh, result uh, in 2001 that really comforted us in, in what the bold signal captures. There's an equivalent paper for resting state activity and that's uh, Schmel uh, and colleague in 2008. It's actually great to have like one of those landmark paper from the field is actually by a researcher with that, who is in Montreal, is at the, the MNI. Uh, I guess people at the MNI probably know Amir. Um, interestingly, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a paper that's kind of like a fascinating history because uh, it, it was started in Nikos Logotetis lab uh, and when Amir tried to publish it, uh, Logothetis tried to fight it. And there was a very public process where the editors of the journal tried to understand like why Nikos Logothetis wanted to block that paper. And they made a very public decision about it and eventually published the paper in human memory mapping. Uh, so, but that's more like a, an anecdote of uh, the scientific process. But uh, what uh, Amir did in that, in that paper is that he had five monkeys and the same setup as Nikos Logothetis had developed. And uh, instead of looking at uh, visual stimuli, he just looked at uh, spontaneous activity. And then he tried to correlate spontaneous activity in local field potential or actually um, uh, electrophysiological activity over many um, uh, frequency bands, like every, every row here is a different frequency band. And what you have, is uh, the correlation between the ball signal and the electrophysical signal in that frequency band for different time lags. And, and you see that the correlation peaks with a time lag of about five seconds. But now it did not apply a, a convolutional model, like it didn't try to model the hemodynamic response function. So his correlation are fairly low at 0.2, but I'm pretty sure that if he had actually properly modeled the hemodynamic response function, his correlation would have been higher than that. But the correlation were robust over many experiments, many animals, and uh, as a control experiment, it also tried to sort of shuffle the ball time series and the electrophysical time series. And he saw that when he, he shuffled and broke the temporal dependency, he could not observe any, any robust correlation. So that uh, made him really confident that there is a relationship between endo, uh, ongoing uh, uh, electrophysical activity and the ball signal. Even though those waves I was describing are really slow, like 20, 30 seconds, I really think what they capture are thoughts. 
and um, uh, in electrophysiological signal, we are more uh, used to focus on sort of like high like speed uh, oscillations, and that's not what we're talking about here. But at a very low time scale, you do have a, a fluctuation in your electrophysiological signal that does correlate with with bold signal. So it's it's not no, it's just a, a, a completely different scale of temporal activity essentially you're looking at. And it does match to, to some degree. Um, now, I, I wanted to touch a, a word on this like intrinsic versus intrinsic business. There's also a temptation to consider that resting state is like this sacred thing. Like when you look at spontaneous uh, at resting state data, you have access to resting state connectivity. And if you were to do a task with your subject, it'd be something completely different. And already the 2003 paper by Gracious, that idea was shred to pieces, it's just not the case. Like he did a uh, seed based uh, experiment in resting state, but he also did it during a visual task. And he got the exact same maps. <laughs> so, you know, there is a lot of spontaneous activity, even when subjects engage in task. And depending on your subject, they may actually be thinking about their own stuff more than they pay attention to your task. Then I may actually even be sleeping. Um, I, I'm, I'm getting scanned a lot. I'm a terrible subject. I tend to, to sleep and not listen to what I'm being told. Um, I should probably fire myself. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, the, the, the important distinction is not between task and rest. It is really between intrinsic and extrinsic activity. And those activities are both present during any task and they interact and should ideally be modeled jointly because this idea is that to focus on only what you evoke in the brain is just ignoring that the, you know, the, the majority of brain activity is self-driven and not driven by your task. And uh, even in modern deep learning sort of brain decoding experiment, I'm blown away that 99% of the paper just try to decode uh, based on the task, say the images presented to the subject, I do not try to model intrinsic brain processes. It's mind blowing. It's been, it's known, like it's majority of your signal is in the intrinsic part, not the intrinsic part. So you need to model it. Um, so in terms of an example of a small analysis, um, uh, there's this Andrews Anna paper and um, uh, it's, it's, it's basic, but it's well done. And what she did was simply to take a, 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 a seed in the posterior cingulate cortex and she had two groups of subjects, some old, some young. And uh, she, you know, she did an average for the young, an average for the old. And she saw that you know, the anterior cingulate cortex uh, appeared to be more weakly connected. And when she did the contrast, she, she saw some significant differences, and in particular with this like, anterior posterior connectivity. Um, so what she did next is just to look at two regions and see if she could confine that with just a more region of interest approach. And uh, you can see the difference between the young on the left and the, the, the old on the right. And there was also some more like continuous edge effect, even within cohort. So she concluded that uh, resting set connectivity is sensitive to edge uh, effects. Um, I mean, there's a lot to say, uh, but one of the questions I get when I present this, this, this study, I, I present it mostly because the statistics are really straightforward, but um, I, I find it interesting that like, people say, well, does it replicate? And um, I, I don't remember I, who, who it is, oh God. Um, but I commented on the GitHub repo, I noticed one of you plans on looking at edge effect in resting state fMRI. And I think it would be pretty rad to replicate that, try to replicate that result uh, using an independent sample, you know, as a sort of like side bonus uh, achievement uh, wh while you're busy doing that. Um, so that's all I have in terms of the, of the resting set connectivity, what it is and how, how it can be used. Uh, as I said, those are very sort of like basic ways of extracting features from your data, but that's how it's done. I mean, to this date, many, many cutting edge papers just use those, those metrics. And my group mostly uses those metrics. They are simple, they're in a way fairly well understood. And uh, it's unclear actually that you can gain a lot by more advanced metrics um, uh, when you have very advanced uh, analysis you, you build on top of them. Uh, I'm just going to, to conclude by uh, pointing you at a few resources if you want to go uh, further. 
So there's three, three kinds. Uh, first, in terms of how to pre-process your data, then in terms of how can you do your stats and your machine learning, and finally, when you can, where you can build more conceptual knowledge about this. Um, so in terms of pre-processing, uh, go for fMRI prep. I know yesterday, Karim has this very like, yeah, do MATLAB, do whatever. I, I'm a little bit more opinionated here. We've got a stack for the school, and I'm uh, showing you tools that fit well with that stack. fMRI prep is great. Uh, it is containerized, uh, it is well maintained, it's extremely well documented. Uh, it, it actually goes in much more uh, details documentation than the slides I have on pre-processing here. Uh, so you can ch check check the written docs website. Uh, there's also a little video that was prepared last year by Basile Pinsard. So you can just like watch it if you want to learn about uh, fMRI prep. Basil uh, is part of the school this year again, so we can ping him or even have him organize a little tuto if, if you think it's important to have a more, more of a, a, a presentation on this. It's uh, perfectly feasible. In terms of the stats and the machine learning, Nylon is your, your friend. It's uh, an amazing package. It's built by a, a, a now large and diverse community, but it was initiated by a group with an extraordinary track record in building high quality software. They notably started the Scikit-Learn project, which is one of the main machine learning toolbox used in the world. One of the things that's amazing with Nylon is its documentation. So if you go on the website, you have those, all those tutorials. And if you want to build uh, functional connectivity maps or matrices, uh, you just click on the thing and execute the notebook and it will do the thing. <laughs> it's no more complicated than that. Um, and you've got lots of use cases uh, in there. So enjoy. And finally, in terms of conceptual knowledge, I would highly recommend this little book. I think it's really like 150 pages, not, not that expensive. It's made by Russ Poldwag, Janet Manford, and, and Tom Nichols, who are like three amazing researchers in the, in the field. And it's very well done. It covers all the basics. And I think with that, you, you're well equipped uh, to dig into whatever else. Um, and finally, if you want more of a kind of like a, uh, a bit of fun, I would encourage you to watch this video uh, called the Resting State Network. I, I don't know if you have the sound, but it's a great intro to resting state connectivity and cluster analysis. So I'm not going to play the video for you, but yeah, go, go watch the video. It's, uh, it's uh, really nicely done uh, by da Daniel Margulies a couple of years back now, but it's all, all spot on uh, even in 2020. So it's 10 by 10. I took exactly an hour. Um, so first, is there any question on functional connectivity in fMRI? Um, I mean, it's at the end of the chat, but there was one about how does the DMN compare or interact with uh, attentional networks? I guess you touched a bit on that, actually. Yeah, I did. And so. um, uh, maybe you want to uh, elaborate on that after. But the other one was about the, the last paper you showed. Do you think the age-related differences could actually reflect uh, differences in the vascular system? They do. So it's very well known at this stage is a, a really nice paper by Rick Oak's group and uh, uh, Claudine Gauthier is the first author. Um, she's uh, now moved on. She, she has her own lab at, uh, at Concordia University, but she showed that very clearly that uh, there are systematic differences in vascular properties uh, in age and that uh, may explain some of the age differences we see. Uh, so they, 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 they do uh, in brief. Now, I, to what degree they do, it's still unclear to me because um, so there's a game that people play a lot is to say, oh, look at this confound and it explains some of your connectivity. So, sure, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's quite hard to actually really understand how much of, of the resting set connectivity is being uh, explained by those factors. And something that some people sometimes overlook is that uh, vasculature is, is not, they are not pipes. I mean, they play the role of pipes, but they're uh, part of our body and they evolve over time. And the nature of the pipes you have may actually be driven in, to a large degree by the activity of your brain. <laughs> so they're not independent things. 
you get a lot of those papers. Oh my God, respiration can predict uh, evolution of connectivity. Of course, respiration predict emotional state. They predict so much about behavior. What do you think? Of course, they associate. So it, that's really not a confound. They actually capture the same bloody cognitive things. So it's, it, I, I find it a little bit maddening sometimes reading those papers that are like a gacha feeling. Uh, really, all our physiological processes are ultimately there to serve cognition and are somewhat related to some aspects of cognition. Um, but there's a lot of wet, wet work doing that. Uh, Jin Shen is another person in, in Toronto whose uh, who's lab is, is looking primarily at that, and there's a very active literature. Um, so, yeah, this, this observation uh, was more of a proof of concept, and I don't think it was presented any, uh, in any other way, right? Like the, the question was just like, can you track age with resting state connectivity? Yes, uh, 